Review Commission Spending and Subcontracts Subcommittee. Uh, we're meeting today, Wednesday, February 17th uh, from five to seven. It's a remote meeting on Zoom. Um, uh, the meeting will be recorded um, and put up on Northampton Open Media's um, YouTube page. Uh, we'll do the call to order. Um, so we'll do a roll call. Noah, can you call us? Yeah, Dan. Yes. Michael. <laughs> Here. Josie, not yet here. All right. right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we have the meeting minutes um, from the, the last meeting. Um, I will admit I did not actually read them uh, when they got sent today. Okay. So I, 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 did, I did read them, but if you want to postpone uh, passing them until our next meeting, I think that's appropriate. Yeah, just in case Josie also has some thoughts, that'll so yeah, we'll just that's smart. Leave that as a tabled thing. All right, cool. Um, and so the next part is opening up the floor to public comment. And so public comment in these um, meetings is three minutes long. Um, you can say whatever you'd like in that meeting, uh, in that time. If you go over that time, I will uh, ask you to finish up your last thought. Um, and if you don't have time, you can always make comment um, by sending an email to Noah and Coffee More at NorthamptonMA.gov. Um, let's just be real, there's only one person in here. <laughs> um, so if you want to unmute yourself, um, Jody, and make your comment, please do. You're gonna try and do an ask to unmute. Okay. Um, so maybe we should uh, push the public comment to a few minutes, a uh, few minutes down the road. <laughs> All right. Um, so the next, um, the next items that we have are um, focusing recommendations for the allocation of previous budget cuts um, with potable water access inside clean public bathrooms. Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted by cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's, oh, Jody, welcome back. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so did you hear the spiel about um, how public comment works? No. Okay, that's fine. Um, so uh, public comment is limited to three minutes. Um, during that time, you can say whatever you'd like. So I will unmute you. You can unmute yourself, obviously. Uh, there's a small number of us at this point. Um, if you run over three minutes, um, I'll just interrupt you and ask you to finish your last thought. Um, if you have more to say, you can always reach out to um, our admin, Noah, and they'll forward our or your comments to all of us and they put their email address in the chat. It's ncoffeemore at northamptonma.gov. Wait, well, sorry, what was that last part about the email? Um, if you send an email, if you wanted to fin like if you wanted to say more or had additional thoughts, um, you can always reach out to Noah. Um, and coffee more, and they can forward that email uh, along to the rest of the commission. Okay, so the people, the number of people here is just on the screen, like just the, there's five people now, right? That's correct. Yep. Right. Um, but this meeting is being recorded, and it will go up onto Northampton Open Media, um, so it is a public record. Okay, great. All Thanks. right. Um, so, uh, if you want to start with your comment, I'll start the timer. Oh, well, can it be, and it, can I ask a question? My understanding is that um, some people want to defund the Northampton police by 50%. Is that correct? Um, so you can, we generally don't do a back and forth in these, but I think it's okay to say, yeah, there are, there's a group of activists who have proposed a 50% budget cut. That's correct. And that's what this meeting's about? 
No. So that's a group of activists. This is the Policing Review Commission. Oh. And so we are a group that was created by the city council and the mayor's office to look at, uh, we had 18 different items that are charged to look at <laughs> um, <laughs> across all sorts of different things. This is the group that is the spending and contracts um, subcommittee. So we look at how the police budget works, where money goes, how it flows, uh, both between the the police department and other city entities, what contracts exist, what grant funding exists, all of those things to really understand how the, the police spend their time and the resources that the city gives them to the best of our ability. Oh, okay. Well, this might not be totally on point, but I just, uh, I guess you can start my three minutes. Um, I just want to s vocalize my um, strong support for a fully funded Northampton Police Department um, and to please not make a 50% cut and please allocate the resources to the officers. Um, I am a domestic violence survivor. Um, I was actually in New York City at the time and the NYPD um, showed up within five minutes. Um, it was a life-threatening situation and um, the officers checked on me every week. This is a, New York City is a very diverse city, as you might imagine. Um, my understanding is that the proposed, these uh, the activist group, the proposed cuts are somewhat um, based on race related reasons. Um, so I can speak after having lived in a very diverse city where white skin is a minority, um, that even there, the police were, I'm not sure I would be here if they had not come to my aid and had not been to able to come within five minutes. So that's the issue. I'm very concerned that a 50% cut and a police department, which my understanding is there have not been no incidents here. Um, um, there have been no race related violent incidents between the police and the citizens. There haven't been any, um, any incidences of police brutality at all that I know about. So I just want to, um, give my strong support to the police department and just please make sure that they have what they need to continue doing the job that they are doing. Um, because from a domestic violence survivor perspective, seconds and minutes can really make the difference. And if they're only like two or three officers on duty I'm at, a, at any given time, um, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm almost positive somebody, somebody's gonna lose their life because of that. And they need to be armed because abusers are armed. That's my comment. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I know that we had um, one more person join uh, via phone. Um, so the phone number 413-582-7081. Um, if you'd like to make a statement, you can unmute yourself. Um, the, same, the same rules apply to all the others that we'll have, um, we'll have three minutes. Um, you have three minutes to make your, um, make your comment. Um, all right. So phone number seven, uh, that ends in 7081. If you wanna unmute yourself, you can start your, start your statement. Can you hear me? This is Hildegard. Can you hear my voice? Yes, we can hear you. Well, I, there's some redundance happening here because I'm at several meetings one day after another. I'm sure you've heard this from me before, and I apologize for the redundance. Hildegard Friedman, living in G68, Cahill Apartments. And I have repeated again and again that there are too many dead bodies and we need to do something about the detox other than what we are doing now. Okay? I am in G68 Cahill Public Housing, Hildegard Friedman. All right. Thank you. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to that or was that, that it? That's it. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, so with that, we'll move on um, from the public comment period <laughs> um, and go back to where we were. Um, yeah, and so on our agenda, which I had up and then promptly lost, so many tabs open and none of them are, none of them are the one that I want. Sorry, I'm gonna go. Oh, I just minimized it, wow. All right, um, so we're gonna focus on recommendations for the allocation of previous budget cuts to, um, and the, uh, the different items that we had hoped that they would go to. Um, so the, on the list um, that we have is potable, uh, well, so far, and this is from um, the demands that were made over the summer, um, when those things, uh, when those budget cuts were made, and that is um, access to water year round. Um, we've, we've expanded that to be access to potable water and clean public bathrooms. Um, don't, um, I don't know if Michael, you wanna start with some other things that you would, that you think we, that should have been spent on. Um, or could be spent on still since it still exists as a sum of money. <laughs> yeah, this is um, this is a, a topic that I've discussed with some people just this week actually about uh, the need um, to to use this money for the betterment of our community. Uh, outside of the two things that you have listed there, Dan, you know, I think, you know, we when we were discussing the budget in June. The mayor had said at that time, I'm not going to reuse this money. I'm just going to let it go back to the stability fund. Uh, I know I've said this before, but I'm just, I think it, it's, it, it's worth repeating that that money, uh, he, he is basically, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of stuck to his word on that. And uh, he's, I know he's been, been planning for this uh, resiliency hub. Um, you know, Mana this week stood up a warming shelter, which I think has um, been so necessary. And I, but I do wish, you know, based on the fact that that we're surviving, a uh, it was my my three minutes up. Um, the uh, <laughs> um, the uh, that we're we're talking about life in a pandemic where public restrooms are closed, uh, places to to sit uh, and be warm uh, are closed. So I, I, you know, like everybody on the commission, I think as I've looked at, at these things and realized that there's a shortcoming in our community for these, uh, I wish that, that those things had been done. Uh, beyond, beyond that, I do think, uh, you know, my, the, the letter that I sent you, uh, Dan, and, and then you, you had forwarded to the rest of the commission, uh, you know, uh, part of me feels that, that the idea around equity here uh, and an exploration of equity throughout the entire city. And I know right now there's a there's a separate subcommittee of the council studying the ordinances that we have in place already to make sure that there's equitable outcomes for everyone. But you know, an office of equity or even an officer of equity, if it was not you know a, a, a multi-person uh, you know thing, uh, if it was just one person to start with, you know, that's something that I felt that money could be. Could be spent on as well. There, that money's there. Uh, we could we could put more teeth to it by having it be a paid position. Uh, so that's on my mind as well. Um, I think for me, one of the things that that sticks out is that um, you know, in the so looking at it, it breaks down to about nineteen percent of of arrests in Northampton are of unhoused people. Um, and in the last meeting um, where the chief, uh, sorry, the last time the chief uh, spoke to us, you know, was saying, you know, it, it doesn't matter who, if someone is using the bathroom outside, uh, it doesn't matter if they're unhoused or not, they get arrested. <laughs> um, and that really, I mean, that, that, that was like the sort of like, okay, so <laughs> there seems to be a disconnect here in that if we aren't providing people a space to do something that every human, every living human being does that's safe and that's clean so that they can do that, then of course they're not going to. <laughs> right. Um, but then, you know, then you have to decide is, you know, sort of, you know, elimination 
that's a normal human practice of any form, is that okay? Uh, or is that worth the risk right now where I am? Where do you go? And so I think the, the things that we're asking for are pretty simple um, in terms of, of sort of feasibility, in terms of potable water access and indoor bathrooms. And I think that the mayor's resiliency hub, if, if and when it starts, will be a space for that. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't address anything now. I think they were planning for a fall opening, like a soft opening in the fall. I think, he's, I I think he's hoping for that before next, before the next cold season hits. Right, which is great, but that also leaves, you know, the next eight months or, <laughs> or right. so. Um, yeah, just, just in relation to that, the anecdote that I've said is, I mean, if I was sitting on my front porch and I need to use the bathroom, I would come into my house and use the bathroom. But if my front porch is Pulaski Park, I don't have the opportunity right now because bathrooms are closed. The public facilities are closed. Even there's a number of, of generous restaurants in town that allow people to come in and use their bathrooms uh, and, and warm up and, and sit, uh, you know, and, and those are not available now either. So it's, you know, this is a major, this is a major concern, I think, uh, especially right now while it's cold out, but, but, but you're right. Even when it's warm out, it's not going to matter as, uh, as the chief said, if you're going to the bathroom outside, you're, you know, you're committing some sort of crime. Um, so I think I would like, at least for myself, if we're going to specify things that could be done, <laughs> um, access to indoor bathrooms, access to indoor water sources, uh, and it doesn't have to be anything, you know, beyond what's already offered, right? Like a, like a water station that has a bottle filler would be perfect, right? Like that's, that's a relatively low, like, we, we have them. We could put it right in, right in the basement of, of city hall where those bathrooms are. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, it's you just, know, yeah. So like doing some of those things where, you know, maybe that means that you have to pay someone to clean those. Um, you know, so there's, there's custodial fees to that, but thinking that that's a pretty, that's a pretty low bar that's, and city hall is ostensibly a public building and it's pretty central, um, to a lot of to a lot of spaces in the city so i would hope that that would be easy um the ones that are harder or not not harder but the ones that are more complex again the storage and showers that would be something that the resiliency hub is might include the proposal at least for the resiliency hub includes those things um, right but um just thinking about like year-round access to a warming and a day a warming center day shelter um, and that's really important. It's not just that it's cold here. There are also days where it's oppressively hot um, as well. <laughs> and so thinking about like, what does that, what does that mean? Yeah. And how, um, I know that MANA does a lot. <laughs> and so, so much. It, it does seem like this is a, a function that the city could either absorb or partner with another group to do uh, rather than leaving it solely on, on MANA who's trying this as a temporary thing. And the city, the city does have uh, hired custodians, um, you know, and, and for, so in our, in our buildings, public buildings now, there are people working in them. Uh, it's like a skeleton crew. I'm not exactly clear what, what that is. I mean, the, the restaurants are at 40% capacity. I don't think our public buildings are at 40% capacity, our, our public offices, I should say. Um, so those custodians might be able to take that on. And I, and I don't, certainly don't want anybody to get sick uh, with this COVID, but at the same time, you know, if, if we're putting the right measures in place, we can protect everyone. Uh, and, and we have $800,000 to do it with. Um, so I agree with you, Dan, about that. And, and, you know, it is, yes, there are cold days, there are hot days, and there's pouring rain days. And, and those are, I would imagine, I have, I'm very fortunate in my life, but those, that's got to be difficult to recover from, to be wet all day. And you're still wet the next day, your clothes, your belongings, you know, it's, it's so vital to think about this. Um, so at least thinking about what we might say about these things, um, I would say those would be sort of like the like immediate reinvestment, right? That was the whole, like that was the whole point of, of those cuts was that it wasn't supposed to be punitive. It was a point to reinvest in the community and to really focus on the people who are the most uh, the most marginalized um, in Northampton and in the Northampton context. Um, 
And you know, to say that a group of people who do not make up 20% of Northampton's population by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I mean, I think CSO, uh, was it CSO or Elliot House was sort of estimating like 160 or 200 people. Um, I, I think I think that's uh, all three counties together, actually, Ham, yeah. Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin. So Northampton's only a part of that. Yeah, and to to say that that's that's 20% of our arrests is disconcerting, right? Like, th there's got to be something going on. And so I think a lot of the research that we've looked at before shows that, you know, if you intervene <laughs> with support and services, you don't have, um, you don't have the, you don't have people committing crimes in the same way. Like there's still the criminalization of poverty in, in a lot of different ways, and that's not going to magically undo it, but this is one intervention point. Um, yeah, and and if you're, I mean, our, uh, to, we've we've kind of discussed this before, and and it's not very clear, uh, unfortunately. But it's nineteen percent of the arrests. So you're criminalizing these people. You're 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 taking them, you're fingerprinting them, putting them into a cell, and closing the door. But are there charges pressed? You know, are is there a victim to this crime uh, in a lot of cases? And, and what is the outcome of that arrest? You know, is it, you know, is it necessary basically? Yeah, and that's gonna be a little more difficult. Um, so I know that we had requested the, the data from um, the Hampshire, um, the district court. Yeah. Um, the, the responses that they gave us saying like there was only eight <laughs> um, convictions and pleas um, we're like, well, oh, that seems a little weird. Um, and it is weird. And so I checked in um, with a couple different lawyers and they were like, yeah, the, the data they gave you isn't what you want. <laughs> and in fact, some of it's for cases that are actually really old. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, but that's an issue. Um, the other part of it is that uh, the language that we used, um, we wanna look for, we wanna ask for dispositions and we also need to ask the clerk's office um, because they're the ones that would set the um, that would set the charges. So the question is, who are they charging? Who are they not? Who are they just saying move on? And then all of the other things that come into play that we didn't get with the data that we got from the the Hampshire um, district court, which is things like who who went for um, things like. Um, a continuance. Um, so basically who's not admitting that they're guilty, but they're not admitting they're innocent either. They're just saying we're going to continue and then good behavior. And then as long as you meet that, you can, sometimes that's dismissed. Sometimes it's never dismissed, which is an issue. <laughs> um, but essentially looking, you know, if we want to look to what are, what's the, the process for the Northampton Police Department's time spent on this population. And then what does it get the city to like get um, in terms of what we what the city would expect back out of these, we're gonna need to ask for more information. And I'm not sure that we're gonna get that before <laughs> no, we're, March 9th. Um, yeah, we're 28 so, days away, 29 days away from the report being due. <laughs> yeah, um, so just thinking, I mean, we don't, at this point, I don't wanna, put too much into that part other than, you know, I mean, we can, we can say the Northampton Police Department arrests 600 and some, some odd people each year. Um, given that they go on about 30,000 calls, that's a pretty low number, which is good. Um, but <laughs> um, they also end up using force about 84 on 84 calls a year as well. So that's something to think about. Um, for the larger commission, but for us, it becomes a little less clear on what we can say they spend, um, or in terms of what what sort of resources the city's funneling to that. But I think we can make a pretty strong argument um, in terms of spending the the money that's already been cut cut because it hasn't, and making sure that there's a push for reinvestment into the things that we do care about that prevent those type of offenses. Um, very specifically, so like the crimes of poverty. Um, Josie, you're in. <laughs> yeah, I am. I am. I'm so sorry. I went to go. I've been jumping around because I'm moving in March. 
and I thought this meeting was at 5.30, so I was driving on my oh. way back, and then I, I literally pulled into my house, and I saw your message, I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta jump in. <laughs> uh, but I'm here now, and I, I'm guessing that we're talking about um, the focusing on recommendations for the allocation of previous budget cuts, or are we on the next part? Uh, we did the the allocation, We um, just listing potable year-round access to potable water, indoor bathrooms, and um, access to a uh, warming or a day shelter that's year round, um, providing storage and shower spaces, but those are things that the resiliency hub should be taking care of. Mm -hmm. should be, if it gets up and running, um, I'm also gonna say maybe we like, one of the <laughs> one of the recommendations is that the mayor should take some of the money that was meant to reinvest in the community and put that into the resiliency hub because I don't believe that's been done yet. Right. That, yeah, that's a question that I have for the mayor and for for the planning director, and I, I may reach out to them and, and ask that question is if if the city put more money into it now, could it possibly be opened earlier? Is the, I mean, rather than a fall opening, like you mentioned, Dan, as, as the goal, if if some of that eight hundred thousand dollars was taken to try to um, speed the process up, could the could the resiliency hub open earlier, maybe when it's one hundred and five degrees up? Um, or um, I would say earlier or expand the offerings that they were having, right? Some of the concern was that it would cost too much to have showers put in um, or that it would cost too much to have accessible bathrooms and things like that. And so like to say, no, we can, we can do that. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's probably the, the idea there. Um, all right, cool. So I wrote, I wrote that down as well as a thing to circle back to. Awesome. Uh, did we have any uh, public comments that like were like intrigue? Like, did I miss anything? Or is that our typical our typical very small crowd? Uh, it's it's still a small crowd. Uh, we had two speakers. Um, I'm going right, to get your line. Fuck. Um, one of them was um, a, that there were too many um, too many deaths from opioid use um, yeah. in this, and then the other was um, around a uh, positive experience with the police in New York City responding really well um, to um, to an abuse situation uh, really effectively and checking in with that person regularly afterwards too. Cool. That cool, cool, cool. That awesome. Um, I feel like I'm just like kind of like just jumping in and like I don't want to steer away from the, the the conversation that you're having. But like, um, some a number that keeps on kind of popping into my head uh, about this whole situation, and I kind of brought it up a little bit at um yesterday's meeting. But like, let's imagine right just for a second that we cut the police budget by 40 percent and just have the police department for the most part operate it the way it did in 2010 right would that like is that just not feasible anymore or i just i don't know a 40 percent increase over 10 years is massive so i think the there's a whole bunch of things that go into that, right? So like one of the things to note is that the crime rate's gone down um, and it's mm -hmm. not nationally in here, which is, um, it, that is what it is. Um, but the police have also absorbed more functions over mm -hmm. time. And so it's gonna be important that, again, that if there's a cut to their funding, it's like the, the functions that they do for the most part still need to mm -hmm. be done by someone <laughs> right absolutely. so that part like that's got to be set you know who's going to do what um mm -hmm. the other part um and alex alluded to this a bit as well which is that the there are cost of living increases the police department's gone above those um right. but, but it's going to still be personnel so like there's if there was if there was a massive cut to the police budget, um, the the city and the union, I can almost guarantee, would be in a very long, very 
very difficult battle legally um, to figure out where those cuts are going to, like how that's going to play out. Um, right, of course. What could happen is that, again, and I've said this before, is that the police could involve, um, could engage in things like um, impact bargaining and they could have, you know, reductions in, or they could forego, but in, in 2010, they did this where they, for, they um, the union um, agreed to forego wage, uh, wage increases, right? Everyone was frozen. Um, right. And there was also a hiring freeze and some other stuff. Um, they could do that again. And the department, you know, the city has a lot of control over that department in terms right. of the structure of it. And so they could do a huge, they could in theory engage in all these things and they could do a restructuring. Um, I don't know how likely that is to happen. <laughs> um, yeah. Or but it, so I guess the answer, the technical answer, yes, it could happen. Um, I'm not sure that that it would. I think we'd have to be really careful about, at least for me, making sure that there's the connection between responsibilities and funding, so that we're of not course. telling them to do more with less. Um, of course, because this is public safety. It needs to be absolutely do public safety, <laughs> and right. In a lot of ways, you know, the redistribution of of responsibilities is not necessarily like a money saver. I don't want it to ever be a money saving, like, oh, we're gonna save money and then we can we do other things. No, it's it's providing safety in different ways. <laughs> like, it's the same or it's not more, right? Yeah. Yeah, always. And yeah. I guess that leads me to my second question or I guess like kind of talking point, uh, which I guess is more directed toward Michael uh, being a, a city councilor and whatnot, but Am I wrong in thinking that when a budget is allocated, it's not just all spent that instant, right? It's something that is spent throughout the course of the year and there's there's funds that kind of just sit around in case of emergency or, you know, if enough responsibility or whatnot happens, there's like a little bit here and there. Is that is that correct? Is that or am I just completely Yeah, I, I mean I think that <clears throat> the let's, I mean, just to break it into the two sides, one would be the income. Of course, you have constant income from restaurants and restaurant X, you know, sales tax, uh, the city's mm -hmm. cut of it, uh, parking, those things that are sort of ongoing. And then of course, the property tax bills that, that you know, um, you know, homeowners and, and apartment building owners and so forth get are sent four times a year. So those are paid quarterly. Uh, so the mm -hmm. city is collecting money all the time. And then to your point, I mean, people, you know, the the great majority of, of what's paid out is is uh, is personnel. Uh, so those paychecks go out every other week. Um, right. So and and you know one of the things that uh, we we did uh, kind of you do it in on council a bunch in in like November and December and then again in uh, May and June is talk, you know, you may have to clean up something where you said like, okay, we're going to spend, you know, a hundred dollars on this and then come to find out what it actually wound up costing the city 105. Well, the mayor didn't mm -hmm. allocate 105. So that he has to ask the council to, you know, move $5 from somewhere into that. Uh, so right. there's always that kind of true up uh, sort of thing as well. So uh, yeah, to your, you know, you're, you are right about that, that, I mean, when you create a budget for this, it's different. I mean, I work in a private store, so we get a budget that says, here's what we want you to sell. And then this, yeah. uh, you know, then you can, you know, put these people in place and these different programs in place. Whereas the city creates their entire thing. This is how much we're going to spend and then taxes uh, people to pay for it all. Right. I guess, I guess the reason why I asked that question is because I mean, how much of a bureaucratic nightmare would it be if, you know, we, if the commission kind of recommended uh, an allocation of, uh, of police funding to be kind of like earmarked for like transferability, that way that um, the police have the funds to continue business as usual as we establish the new department, as we establish personnel, so that that money can be transferred from the police to those services as they are getting up off the ground. And in that way, in, at least in my opinion, if, I, if everything works the way that I'm imagining that it is working, you know, 
the police still function and as responsibilities are are pulled away to other um, kind of organizations or other, you know, departments and whatnot, you know, that equivocal um, funding goes along with it. And it's not something that's just like, oh, at the beginning of the year, pull it all out, put it here. Because in my mind, if we do that, then those funds for the quote unquote new department or new personnel kind of sit there until personnel arrive or departments arrive. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I think, um, you know, uh, you, you've, you've made me think of two things. One is the Brattleboro report, which included recommendations for, uh, you know, uh, do this this year, do this next year. And Dan's mm-hmm. even referenced this a few times, like, uh, you know, when we've talked about writing recommendations, are there things that immediate reinvestment is one thing we're talking about here, but what about for next year? What about for the following year? Uh, and, and it's part of the reason why I feel like this, this uh, can be an ongoing community discussion. Uh, because these things may evolve, but the other the other thing that I think about was what um, what David Hu said uh, in our meeting not this not yesterday because I missed yesterday but but last week uh, when he was talking about traffic and how he mentioned kind of uh, with a great sort of tongue in cheek thing that he has become obsessed with traffic, but could you take the fender benders? and turn them over to the parking people. And he, he said, maybe you have to rename it transportation or what, he had a couple of different things, but, and then in six months or a year, could they take on another little bit of, of traffic control and another little bit and another little bit. So to what you're talking about is, uh, is that growth of, of another department uh, that, you know, again, for, for things like, like traffic problems, uh, you know, right. maybe people running a red light or a stop sign and, mm-hmm. you know, can, can you grow that department and, you know, in the meantime, you would, you would, I mean, still be expecting the police department to handle it until you kind of evolved into, into that other way. Right. That way there's kind of like no, no gap between the police not having the funding to do something and the wait time it takes to get the other thing off the ground. Uh, just some, those are just some thoughts I was having um, the other night. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Josie really, uh, you know, really thought that out, you know, that's a good question, because uh, it is it is not something that you're just going to be able to to flip a switch on any of this stuff and make it happen. Exactly. This is, this is, and, and I, I actually said this to some friends on the weekend, I had a, a Zoom call with some friends, and we were talking about uh, what, what the Policing Review Commission may come up with for recommendations, and I said, you know, it, this is not just about Mayor Narkowitz anymore. I mean, he's, this is his final budget. This, the, whoever, you know, is going to run for mayor is going to have to talk about what they see as the future uh, and what they mm-hmm. think of the recommendations, which will be public bef- long before they, uh, you know, people go to the polls. So it, right. it, this is, this is going to be something that it may not all happen today, uh, but it, there may be, may be time. Uh, this may, these are going to take time to enact. Yeah, and I mean, some of these things aren't necessarily new. So, like um, for us, the um, you know, for David's you know idea of like what would it take to move traffic enforcement, um, which is actually a large percent of what the police in Northampton do, um, and the most the majority of that time is spent doing radar enforcement, which is basically just sitting in with a with a radar, <laughs> um, you know, at pointed at traffic. Um, you know, because uh, Berkeley is, is moving to do it, right? They, they've passed their proposal. They've got the Department of Transportation um, pretty much up and, and, and set to go. And this wasn't like a, ooh, this is like out of any, um, you know, they were thinking of it, you know, from a process, right? This, this process for them started, you know, last year. Um, but like other places, like so um, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, New York, They've all got proposals up. Um, Cambridge has a proposal for moving traffic enforcement to an unarmed civilian um, department. Um, you know, so it's not even like it's oh, it's some other state. Like right down, right down ninety. <laughs> so it's it's something possible, but I think all of them are doing a fairly progressive sort of push to do any of these, um, so that it's it's iterative. It's it's doing exactly sort of taking, you know, a part of, you know, take a slice, <laughs> do it well, get everyone trained up, make sure that you have the capacity to continue to do that. And then the next one, and then the next one, right? So that it's not necessarily police officers that respond to the low level things, um, you know, um, in terms of like 
uh, you know, again, small fender vendors where the insurance agency wants a representative <laughs> from the government, but it doesn't need to be a police. That, that's not police officer time, right? Like they're not, right? They're not doing law enforcement at that point. At that point, it's very much, you know, an insurance agency wants someone to check off a couple boxes, um, right? And so, thinking about those sort of things, um, there's also a bunch of racial disparities um, in those locations about. Uh, motor vehicle stops. I think in Northampton, we have data that suggests that there is something there, but the data that the NPD actually keeps is not <laughs> uh, ideal. Right. Um, right. And data portal for looking and investigating these type of things in, in an effective way. I mean, I think if I was talking to, to Michael about this a little bit, but, you know, to, to say if you, if we had the money to bring in like an entire analytic you know, consultation to the city, like, oh, that would be wonderful because they could really dig into the data um, to both find those and show them all we're doing is sort of saying like, well, it could be like, based on what we've got, it could exist um, based on the, you know, I don't even know how many hours it was um, of testimony. There seems to be something going there. I think if you ask most of the people of color <laughs> in the city, there's, there's some issues. Um, but they're looking at it, you know, from a very like, okay, if you remove the police, you remove some of that bias. Um, right. That was their their structure. Again, this isn't about saving money. <laughs> um, of course. Because it, it doesn't. Um, but basically, how do you free up the, the police time to do other police things rather than this? And and that and that's yeah. a criticism that you hear uh, of of you know the act of defunding the police by the council this just this year was now we have five officers working some shifts and if one of them has to deal with this and then there's all of a sudden another emergency or or five of them have to respond to a call and now there's another emergency how do they do it well maybe they don't have to respond to the fender benders you know maybe you, that like to your to your point Dan the kind of nonviolent low, uh, you know, lower on the, on the, you know, spectrum uh, items that maybe, maybe they don't have to do that. Right. I think that's, that's the sort of goal. And also one of the things that, that at least I think about is sort of how do you increase the collaboration between departments that already exist, right? Like, so rather than having, and, and the chief, you know, mentioned this, right? So late night where they typically have fewer officers on duty. So, they had one officer who was injured in a car accident and that took up the other four officers to control the scene, stay with, with each person. Um, and so without asking for mutual aid from another city to send more police, who else do you turn to? Um, and that was also sort of what Carol was mentioning at the, the last meeting, you know, where she was like, oh, I sort of, you know, imagine, and she's, she said that a lot of us were too old to remember disp like a disc like a switchboard like a full on switchboard operator. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm hurt that I do remember that, <laughs> 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 um, but that these are the sort of things where like if we had more options, then you could start sending more people. But because the police have continued to get the you know the short end of the stick, they're basically the ones that answer the phone, um, right? in the city that they've just had responsibilities piled on and piled on. So now we're sort of saying, let's let's undo that, reinvest and get people who can respond in a particular way to these things in um, the right way. So it's, it's a lot of just moving things to the, the best um, and the right place. Um, right, and in doing so, right, we build a new kind of vision for public safety that will hopefully elicit a response from the community for those members who don't feel comfortable using the police as it is now to then be able to use those other sources and get the resources that they need and desire. And, you know, we'll have a, a safer, stronger community um, wholesale. And I think, I think this goes back to your point, Dan, that like, it's not about saving money. It's about improving the community. It's about improving safety. It's about making sure that we have a community here that works for everybody. Um. The, the only thing about that, one of the things is that it is going to take time both to establish these departments and yeah. also it's going to take time to get dispatch, like the, di like the dispatch teams also trained to know who, what, when, where, why, right? That's a bigger thing because, you know, for them, 
you know, they get a call, they do their best to triage it with the resources that are available, but they're gonna have to start to make some of those distinctions as well, right? So um, the alternatives um, subcommittee and the commission as a whole has talked a lot about peer, peer led responders, um, you know, and all sorts of different models where it's co-responders with police, with clinicians, clinicians with police, uh, clinicians with a responder who's unaffiliated with an institution, um, all of those different types of models and they all have plus or minuses. Um, but the, the person who's doing dispatch has to sort of triage and say, which is which scenario gets what group, right? Um, mm -hmm. And getting people trained in how to do that also takes time. And that's something that like cahoots has taken a lot of time. Like the, you know, they said that, you know, when they were first getting up and going, it, it took, it took them like a year to get dispatched to like call them for the right things. Um, and, and to make sure that that transition happened because so many people were used to just call the police for an emergency. Um, and the, at the last public hearing that we had, so last week, you know, there was a person who was like, yeah, my neighbor's like plumbing was going on yeah. and it was flooding. They called the police, um, <laughs> you know, because that's what it is. And so dispatch sent the police. And so this is gonna be, I think an ongoing conversation about sort of how do those things happen? How do you get the, it's not just, it, it's part of just having the, the people to respond, right? Like right, right now we don't. Um, mm -hmm. But then also how do you make sure that the right people are being, that the people are being triaged to the right group? So right. be, I think you're right that it's going to be a very iterative thing. I don't think anything that we recommend is gonna have like, you know, take first, uh, you know, July 1st, here's a brand new department. It's fully staffed, everyone's trained. Um, it, right. is gonna take, it is going to take time. Um, and I don't know what the exact timeline is going to be either because we're making recommendations, but the city council and the mayor's office need to put those into place. So I think for us, the best course is to just be realistic about what it is that we're recommending in terms mm -hmm. of plausibility of those things and letting the city, you know, based on how it's going to implement them, decide what that role is. Um, I think it, it is good yeah. to, to know about like if you chose to go, <laughs> we recommend if you know you, if you're doing this, we recommend a progressive introduction of funds and responsibilities. Um, and right. that's that I think we've all been advocating for, which is whoever's doing the job, you know, is paid for that job. That department received those funds so that we don't drop the ball. That's the that's mm -hmm. the biggest concern I think that I've heard. From doing this at, at any point in time, um, absolutely. To, you know who will be there. Yeah. Who will be there to protect me? And the answer is there should always be someone. Um, right. And at no point in this process do we want there to the answer to be no one. Right. Of course. This has been uh, yeah that that's that's definitely a, a key question that comes up often is you know and 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 we had a public comment today about about the the value of of having that that safety mechanism uh so it's it is uh it's a <clears throat> it's a very important part of the part of the uh, equation yeah um i guess my here's a question uh to, to both uh, you dan and you michael uh in your mind because I, I don't think this is something that we've discussed in general meeting or, or in here but uh when you think about these changes being implemented you know what time frame are you using in your mind is it is it a one-year thing three five um more even if you have an estimate based off of what we've been able to see over the last few months uh i think we all agree that it is not a thing that happens day one obviously um you know and the recommendations are obviously going to be there but i don't know what do you envision uh not even the percentage cut and just like the timeline for this new department to develop if of course the city goes along with it. I mean, for, for me, I mean, I've already thrown out the idea of like a percent cut from my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that a percent cut is gonna get us anywhere near what we want or what we would expect. I think that's why, right. you know, in, in a lot of the cities where those larger cuts are sort of proposed that they end up, they end up being smaller cuts, you know, across a, a series of years, right? It's not gonna be a one cut. Um, and in fact, I don't even, 
to me, a budget cut is sort of silly. I just want to see reinvestment. Um, yeah. Like, but what I, what I personally think is that it's going to be that the responsible way to do that is as you transfer responsibilities, you transfer funds that, that the mm -hmm. still as a city, we pay for <laughs> the services that we need. Um, and I'd use the word equivalent. I'm not sure that's the right word um, in the, the sort of statements that we agreed on. Um, mm -hmm. But as it, I don't know the right way, but just to make sure that the responsibilities are fully funded based on whoever's fulfilling them. Um, yeah. And in some ways that might, you know, it might cost the city less at some point um, to have a peer responder rather than a police officer. Um, so I don't even want to tie dollar amounts to it. I just want to make right. sure those things are fully funded. Um, right. In terms of when and how, that's sort of why I wanted to, to do a lot of the, um, to be as specific as we could um, yeah. in these recommendations to say, look, here's the, you know, here's what our recommendation is. Here's the path, but still leave it up to um, the city and the, the mayor's office to, to choose how quickly we move down that path. Uh, yeah. If I, you know, if we look at some of the, some of the different ways that things happen, you know, like it has to be, you know, there is an order of operations in terms of, you know, creating or establishing a new department. There's got to be funds for that. It, I don't think that it can happen midstream um, of course. In, a, in a fiscal year. So if the mayor wanted to take more time to plan that out, you know, from this year, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> and that means that, you know, if we follow that sort of funds transferring and things like that, it's going to be minimal investment in that department at the beginning. Um, depending on the things that we recommend that department take, those, the, again, those are all things that are going to sort of weave into how, how effective <laughs> um, that's going to be and how quickly you can do it. Um, you know, to hire well-trained peer responders is going to take time. Um, yeah. You know, to hire, uh, and, and it's just looking at like the process and, you know, being involved in hiring for public entities. <laughs> um, it, it is a lot of work, you know, there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of, you know, how do we, you know, how do you interview for the right people? How do you even establish this? Um, you know, we've sort of talked about accountability, like community accountability and oversight. And so how does that factor in? Um, so I think those things are going to be, you can throw, <laughs> you can throw a bunch of money at those things, you know, really quickly. And you might be able to get some of them done a little faster. Um, but right. long, long term, I'm, and really thinking about all of the things that, that um, folks have talked about from different reforms within the police department to larger structural changes in the city. If I'm honest, I see this as sort of like, I would love to have it be like a three year conversion time, but I, I think that's, that's yeah. I think five years is even five years is optimistic. Uh, this is going to be a long term plan um, and it's going to take commitment from you know, if, you know, the current mayor um, and, and what he does, but also the next mayor is also going to have, like, this is going to be a plan that they have to buy into and want to make happen because so many of the powers um, that, that exist within the city are in the mayor's office. Um, yeah. But I think that also does the longer term also makes the, makes the pain mm -hmm. of individual departments a little more palatable. Uh, mm -hmm. because it's not a massive change like you know the I don't want to have it be that you know July 1st there's another 10 police officers without a job uh, immediately I mean I don't think that would happen it didn't happen this time um, in fact the police you know the initial at, um, attrition after the budget cut was only really one person right uh, three officers who've never actually started working in Northampton and were still at the academy lost their positions there. They never started. We didn't lose anybody on the ground. Uh, one person resigned and Officer Wallace went from being a SRO after the school. <laughs> this is a wholly separate thing is that the school said they didn't want an SRO anymore. It wasn't a result right. of the budget cut or anything like that. Uh, he went back to being a patrol officer. So right. the minimal impact there. Um, but I don't want there to be larger pushes, like without, without giving people the, the opportunity and also the opportunity to move um, within yeah. the city to say, 
cool, here's a new, it's unarmed traffic enforcement. Do you wanna be part of this? Um, and, and preferencing those officers so that they still have the same access that they did to things like, um, you know, healthcare and benefits and, and all of that. And especially when it comes to like service and like years of service, you know, towards pensions and things like that. We wanna make sure that everyone still has that, that equity um, right. and that access so that they're given preference. Um, so again, I think a multi-year, multi-year is, is like the best. I, I don't think it's gonna be anything less than three to five years at the minimum. And that's a, right. a really hard great. push minimum with everybody involved. Cool, cool, cool. Yep. I, I too see, I too see like a, a strong three to five year kind of pilot on on the the growth of the department where we can you know use that time to really uh, gather data, uh, impact reports, uh, you know testimonials from community members who now feel comfortable using uh, those services. And stuff like that, and I do think it's it's a, definitely a phased approach, um, for sure. Yeah, you you've brought this up a couple times, Josie, about what you know. How do you how would you measure success and accountability uh, for mm -hmm. this? So I think you're right. Thinking about a three to five year plan gives you an opportunity to to see the effectiveness of 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 change like this. Right, which is which is also kind of a criticism uh, uh, toward um, what is it accountability for the current NPD is that, you know, what have they been using to measure, what metrics have they used to justify, you know, the 40% increase over 10 years, right? Is it, is it just tradition that we just continue to put more money into, I know part of it is the, the quality of, of life increases, but the Northampton Police Department has had the largest quality of life increases uh, compared to other, other things that the city funds. And so, you know, I think it's twofold. I think it's measuring the success of uh, the new department um, through the data, through testimonials uh, and all that great stuff. But it's also about, you know, holding the police accountable for those same metrics for their success. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully with less on their plate, they become more successful the things that they are responsible for, right? There's less burnout. There's less, you know, um, uh, interactions due to like, feeling like there's all this pressure, uh, societal pressure on the backs of our police officers. Uh, now that there's fewer things on their plates, they can focus more on the, the, the services they do provide for the community and in turn become stronger uh, for the community. Yeah, I think that's really good stuff. And Elizabeth uh, in one of the, is Elizabeth on alternatives? Um, no. Um... Policies, policies. And she's on policies and services. She, I, I, I was listening to one of their meetings one night and she was talking about how, you know, not like a nonprofit agency that's trying to work on food security, for instance, is, is ultimately hoping to go out of business. Right. I mean, and, and, right. you know, so that's how they measure success is less people are in food insecure. Uh, mm -hmm. So in terms of safety there, you know, uh, are, is our community more safe, uh, do you know what what's the level of engagement we need with a with the armed police department versus unarmed response to certain things and and uh, civilian or peer led response to other things you know so it's kind of figuring out what the success rate is is uh, is key. Mm -hmm. Which leads me back to to one of my 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 biggest points is that Northampton in particular is more poised than most municipalities in the state of Massachusetts to enact these sort of changes, whether it be because of the size of the budget, uh, because of the safety of the community, because of the, the views of the community in general being more uh, toward uh, reallocation and community building than other places in Massachusetts. And if we don't take this progressive step, we're essentially pushing that, that vision onto a different community, a community who is less funded, less poised for success, and, and ultimately probably impacts uh, those, the marginalized communities of that community um, as they go through those growing pains that we'll almost certainly see as well. And you know, what does that say to our residents here at Northampton if we don't take the, those steps is that it's okay, we'll just wait for someone else to do it, right? Then we can have enough quote unquote data to make this decision. And the reason that we don't have data is because there aren't people stepping up to the plate. And I think that Northampton could be that that city that steps up to the plate and kind of is a beacon of both data and light for what these sort of community building changes could look like. 
I love that. And I think the other part is that and this is something that the chief has already mentioned multiple times, which is that the police are doing things that they wouldn't normally do. Right? They're doing things that are beyond the, the remit of what their job was, you know, even a couple of years ago. And so it's important to sort of try our best to also understand that. And it's it's difficult. Um, you know, like I've been working on these graphs. I've got two of them sort of done. And one of them is sort of modeled after the Austin report from um, DH Analytics. Obviously, I can't do as good a job as they do um, <laughs> with that because they, they went really deep down. Um, but I mean, even if you look at, um, so I'm going to share my screen quickly. This is my sort of preliminary attempt at this. And so poke holes and ask questions on this, right? Um, so this is based on the, the data that the chief gave us. Um, this is the percentage of time that the police log um, for calls spent by a category. And so the category is the same ones that, um, uh, the, that, the, that Austin used, I also grabbed. Um, so things that are non-criminal, um, animal control here, um, medical calls that they log as medical, and that includes mental health, um, substance use, the, the breakdown of all of these calls is sort of here and I sort of labeled them to the best that I could. So like a demonstration marks protest, that's non-criminal. Disabled motor vehicle, that's non-criminal. Um, disturbance panhandling, non-criminal. Um, those sort of things versus a non-UCR one crime. So the Uniform uh, Crime Report part one is like the most aggressive violence. So it's aggravated assault, um, domestic assault um, and abuse, um, sexual assault and violence, um, murder, homicide, <laughs> Um, all of those things, and aggravated assault, I should say. Um, even if uh, we don't have like a breakdown between like what assault is and what aggravated assault is uh, in this in these logs, so I even I include just all assault, even though that's not um, what they would would include. Because I don't want to I don't want to underestimate <laughs> um, for these things, but like this and like auto calling, you know, it's un unclear exactly what any of these codes are actually when we ask. The, the chief, you know, she said, we don't have definitions for these, but here's 50 examples of each one. Um, so I did my best to match that up. But the U UCR one, the, oh boy, we really need, like, there's, like you might need like real armed response. There's only 5.7%. And that's actually well above the national average. And I can almost guarantee if we got down to like what the actual UCR definitions is, this would be like well under 3%. Um, that, that would be my guess. Of course, again, we can't get at that. Um, and I don't have, I don't have the ability, so I don't feel comfortable like underestimating anything. Um, but things like here's traffic enforcement, right? It's almost a quarter of their time. Um, non-criminal things is another quarter of their time. And then non-UCR one crime, right? So these are the things that you might call like the, the quality of life crimes and calls. That's what a lot of like, um, sort of criminal justice sort of deems those. Um, and I broke out like really <laughs> traffic should be in this, in this section here. So should animal, um, and then non, non-crime or non-UCR one crime. Um, but I wanted to break those out because just like, you know, animal calls are, you know, almost 10% of their time. Um, it's just on animal enforcement. Um, and then traffic being such a large thing, I hope it should be on its own. Um, but really what we're saying is, you know, this is the one that we're super concerned about. There's always gotta be someone to respond here. There should be people here, but like medical calls, like I don't think the police should be on medical calls. I think we should have more, <laughs> we should have enough people that are trained um, and available to respond to medical calls that can actually respond um, to those as well. And that's not gonna be something super easy to, to parse out. Um, you know, because the police can respond because they have five people um, that are on shift at minimum. And it's usually not, you know, the police aren't usually at their minimum, right? I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a question for you, Dan, about that, like on a medical call, I'm going to ask you a question like your chief Casper and you're going to have the answer, but uh, you know, if, if you mentioned that they respond and, and our police are out, right, they're out on patrol. And so if, if, if there's a medical emergency, 
and they're there first, does that get logged as that? And there may be an ambulance coming behind them. You know, just it's just not getting there as quickly as a as a police officer is if they're in that neighborhood. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there are so so many caveats. I can do my best to answer that. Um, you know, based on what the chief has already told us and what she said in, you know, in in the the public or in the comments that that she had, you know, it was it was very much you know, uh, if police are there, they'll render aid because they're there, which is what they should do. Um, how they log their time though, and this is the police, uh, the chief sent us an email before when we were asking for this information and then we asked for clarification. Um, the clarification back was, well, the system is really bad. Uh, there are also times, and this is undefined, but that there are times where the police have their, um, they put their, they put a call through. So they responded to a call, but then they, they say that they didn't spend any time on it. Um, hmm. But we didn't get a, a response of like why or like a scenario that that would happen, um, which is why, uh, you know, in some of these, if you look at the data, um, I rounded, I'm sorry, let me, come on computer, there we go, let's move this out of the way. Um, but, you know, for some of these where it was, you know, this, this call was for a whole shift was 13 minutes for breaking and entering. Um, but on other shifts, and I think we, we saw this before, was like crime scene investigation was three seconds, you know, for one of them. Um, mm. and, and that's, you know, that's how they were putting it through. So like maybe they were doing something else. So they, they responded to both, but they could only select one, um, you know, because in theory, there could be multiple things going on. So again, this is a limitation. We don't know, <laughs> you know, and the chief didn't seem to have a really good response into like, how do you, how does an officer decide what to log something as? How do they know? Um, <laughs> yeah. What's the established procedure? So this is only based on the log information that the chief sent us. And that's all that we can do. Um, and then doing our best to match those activities. Um, you know, with, with these different things. And that's, again, that's something, yeah. you know, it, it, it's not a perfect match. Um, I'll also say that I did, I did start yeah. estimating or just rounding hours. So there's, I'm going to say about three hours out of the 17,000 that we're missing. Um, <laughs> but as a caveat, you know, they are, they do exist somewhere in, the, or they're not in this yeah. chart, but they do exist. So I've, I've lost those. Uh, with just rounding up because it got, you know, they, de they detailed down to the second in that report and it started to be like, I need, it, or sorry, I didn't round minutes. I rounded seconds up into minutes. Um, You're yeah. amazing. So that's what this is. And this is only for 2019 as well. Um, based on the 2015 to 2019, I just haven't had the time to go through. It, it is a manual, um, it's manual going through the, um, through them. So after struggling with it myself, I actually grabbed my partner and made him like read off things or no, I was reading off things he was typing to make sure that it all got there. And then we could, could go back and check, but it took hours to, to get it all. Um, the other way to look at this. And again, this is a little more like the Austin report um, than anything else. Oops, let me, come on, friend. There we go. Um, and this is actually harder to read because I just did it again. This is just a really quick grab from Excel, so it's not perfect um, by any means. I will zoom in a little bit. Um, but again, it, the idea, right? So this is the ooh, danger zone stuff right here. Like those are the, that's, that's what we're really concerned with. These are the other calls that the police were getting. Not to say that they weren't emergencies. It's just like, if we talk about, I think this is one of the things that, you know, David, had asked the chief was like, what are the calls that the police are uniquely qualified for, right? Like what, what's unique, <laughs> like what, what's special about the police that they respond to a particular thing? And it's, you know, the, the chief referenced these, right? To say like, this is, this is the one, like law enforcement needs to happen here quickly. Um, and, their and their intervention could be critical to saving lives. You could also make that argument here with medical, like, but that's anybody you know, like an EMT could be responding to that. And in fact, you probably want EMTs or peer responders if it's mental health, right? Mental health is in this medical group. Um, but the other thing is that, uh, as the chief said before, um, 
you know, at first she had said it was 20%, mental health was like 20% of their calls um, or that the 20% of their calls had a mental health component to it. And she would like to see others doing that. Um, that's changed. <laughs> um, yeah, and that the last, sense. yeah, the last one, you know, she reported much smaller numbers that they had to hand calculate. Um, we obviously don't have access to that data. I'm also <laughs> not looking to hand calculate <laughs> hours and hours. Um, but I think it's worth noting that, you know, with the reporting here, um, with the reporting on that, that graph that there could have been some of those, those non UCR one crimes or non criminal calls that also do have a mental health component. There could be more medical calls that have a mental health component that don't get categorized as medical mental health for whatever reason. Um, you know, right. so it's just keeping that, that in there, but thinking about, and, you know, again, they could go off what we have here. They could, you know, the, the city could look at, you know, could ask for like a much broader audit. Um, those are super expensive though, but to do like a time audit to go through and say, what are you actually spending time on? Um, you know, those, those things, it, it's hard to do them sort of retro, <laughs> like, because you don't necessarily know what, like how much time you spent on a particular thing, especially if you haven't recorded it well. Um, if you ask me how much time I spent, you know, in my job doing a particular task, you know, eight weeks ago, <laughs> I'm going to struggle to give you an accurate answer. I can approximate right. it to like an hour or so, but um, it's not. And I don't, um, I don't think that that's necessarily palatable, but that's, that's the sort of when we talk about like, all right, what if, you know, animal control was its own department. It's no longer its own department. It's under the police department now. What if you took that back, right? Um, you know, that's 8% of their call volume. So that whoever's taking that on would have to be prepared to handle eight, you know, that, that, that call or the, sorry, that's, that's their percentage of time. Um, but they'd have to be ready to spend that many hundreds of hours responding to those kinds of calls. Um, if it's traffic and we say, oh, we want a new traffic department, um, you know, it's almost a quarter of the, the police, the police's time. It's, you know, uh, you know, 4,000 hours or so in a year, maybe, um, around just those things. That department, you know, again, we talked about sort of progressive scaling and what that might be because that's a lot to take on. So just understanding sort of how people are, how the police department spending its time is gonna change what the process is that we might recommend for folks. Right, right. Um, so that was the sort of like the dig. And then again, like trying to put dollar amounts to these, we can do that. Um, but I'm struggling with the information that we're getting from the chief or the references to other values and data, but then not getting that data. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, asking the chief, like, look, we've been able to account for X amount of time. Uh, we sent the graph originally before the police, uh, before the preliminary report didn't get a response back until right before it. So it couldn't really adjust to it, but to say, all right, so here's 8,000 hours of training, 4,000 hours of field training, unclear exactly, but to say, all right, so there's 12,000 hours of training training time. The police are responding to 17,000 hours of calls, <laughs> um, right. but they have either 33 people, or if we want to go with what they were budgeted for, which is 47, that's another, you know, sort of a bone to pick where it's like, we got 47 because that's what the budget was for. <laughs> um, you know, but thinking about these things in terms of time cost, in terms of time and cost, um, we do need more information before we can start setting a dollar amount to it. And then, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Then it also gets to the, the idea that there's such a, there's such a wage differential between different officers. Um, so there's that to think about so that, you know, if the highest paid officer is responding to a call versus the newest, that costs less. I mean, you can just average <laughs> and sort of get a rougher idea. Um, but then thinking about what that means in terms of the, the other departments too, because a, again, a group who is, um, you know, who's doing peer response, um, maybe they're not making the same hourly wage. I still, I'm still gonna push and advocate for a well living wage, <laughs> um, but 
you know, they might not make as much. And then so then is it, will the, and this is something to sort of think about like how the budgeting process is, where do you want to put the difference between those? If we're, if we're allocating funds, do we have more peer responders? If it costs, you know, significantly less and there's the opportunity for it, do you have more or do you keep them, excuse me, or do you keep uh, whatever the department determines is what it needs and then have that funding go into something else like a program for like micro grants or, um, you know, pilot and seed money for other projects. Uh, so it, it's, it's gonna take a lot of thinking in terms of like the sort of budgetary loops. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. One of the yeah, one of the things I've been thinking about in terms of pushback on how to account for hours uh, is that like like you had said, if you had to think about how you spent time on a project eight weeks ago, how difficult it is to account for that. But also, when you look at seventeen thousand hours, eight percent of it is on animal calls. I just did the math here because I like math, but it's like fourteen hundred and sixty hours it's almost impossible to create something for those 1400 hours because you don't know when those calls are coming. I mean, you almost, you almost, no matter what you're going to do, you're going to wind up with, you know, I guess we wish because you call it time waiting for the calls. Uh, you know, so I think about that too, because it's, um, you know, there are, there are some of those duties, right. That go to a department that can take on a little bit more by adding another person or whatever. And th this is how the, the role just, just expands, uh, you know, even, even in this uh, budget uh, for this fiscal year we're in now, the health department was talking about enforcing uh, the no smoking in public parks and the enforcement arm was going to be the police, right? So, and you know, you're going to have police on patrol. You, we have officers walking through downtown Northampton. So we'll just throw this on their plate too. Uh, you know, and it's just kind of one of those things that I think to, to try to understand the hours devoted to animal control uh, or animal calls, because in, in some cases it, it's not just animal control. It may be a, a, a legitimate emergency with a, with a rabid animal or something. Uh, it's hard to, to say that we could take these hours and move them because it's going to take more than those hours uh, to be prepared for them. Uh, so I just want to point that out because I think that's important to think about too. Yeah. I mean, I always want to track the responsibility and the funding and not so much the time, but I do want to at least have like a rough idea because again, if we're asking either departments, so let's say, all right, so now, you know, we go back to the, you know, the department of health, so no, you can't have police officer time for enforcing masks. You know, um, you know who's going to do that? <laughs> uh, and you're going to say, okay, here's how much time I need from you, right? Some amount there. Um, the same right. thing for like mental health calls. I mean, if we took, you know, um, you know, just the what's listed in here, which is significantly less than what the chief initially estimated. Um, you know, they they look at like maybe 300 hours of mental health calls a year is what they're logged as um just under the medical mental health again it could be spread out under a lot of things that get that get added and that gets missed because you can't have multiple tags which seems weird because access has had that since like i was in like middle school you have multiple tags i don't understand why the software doesn't allow it but um you know, if we went to, you know, let's say we said to the Department of Care or safety or whatever it is, here's, you know, here's how much you need, or here's what we want you to do. Um, or if we went to an existing entity, so like Hampshire Hope, we said, you know what, the police aren't going to respond to um, the medical calls for drug use, that's going to be you. Uh, the first thing that they're going to say is like, how much are you going to ask me to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. the, the sort of those logistics and to say, we can't predict exactly when, but here's an average over the past few years of sort of a staffing level that you might need. Um, or in this case, here's last year's values. Um, and it's not even last year, it's 20, uh, these are 2019, right? Because 2020, we don't have. Right. Um, so those sort of things, it starts to become a, a real question of what what we'd like them to do, we can estimate at least. But again, this is this leaves us as the reactive group um, because we still need to know who, <laughs> like we still need to know what this new department is going to do before we can pull out, you know, values. Um, the same thing, like we need to know, like, are we 
are we going to, and this is sort of the, the next item in terms of the cost of creating a new budget, uh, the budget, yeah, a new department and budget <laughs> is that, you know, we have to be able, you, you have to say like, what kind of staffing are we going to have or what do you need? Um, is this new department, is it going to be, you know, in terms of a rollout, is it going to be, you know, a director and maybe a couple employees to even figure out what the future of that department is and to do the sort of like on the ground like work that they're gonna to need to do to establish relationships and figure out boundaries with other existing departments, all those sort of things, and then set their scope and then set their own measurable objectives to go forward. Or are we gonna put, or, you know, is this gonna be like a, no, the department and 10 people get hired, you know, let's say by, by September, um, you know, and you move from there, which again, it's feasible, uh, but it's going to be difficult. It's going to take a lot of buy-in from everyone involved. Um, but the budget for those things and the money that you might need to scrounge up is going to be different. Right. Um, I think I would like the, uh, I mean, so, you know, David's talked about, you know, the, and the policies and services um, subcommittees talked a lot about detail, detail work. Um, I don't think detail work is going to go anywhere, um, but you know, even if we ear, if we recommended that they earmark, you know, half of the the detail pay that the city gets, um, so open up detail to open up detail work to anybody, <laughs> um, you know, civilian flaggers or police officers or you know DPW workers, whoever, um, if they want that, keep the same you know sort of relationship that exists where the city gets some funds back from it, you know, and then you have. Um, you know, you still got that income coming into the city. The city can still keep a lot, a large portion of it, but you can still redirect that back as a reinvestment point. No um, question about it. And, you know, assuming it, it trends sort of even, it's like, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, which is nothing to, to smirk at when it's a regular oh. um, and reoccurring. Uh, well, the, the, whole, the whole health department's $500,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's another that's that's another really exciting thing in my mind about the development of a, of a new department is that at the end of the day it's 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 more jobs here at, at in Northampton right and it's jobs uh, with the with the viewpoint of improving the community community building uh, and you're you're gonna have people who you know are from the community for the most part I believe so working these jobs getting to know one another and establishing. Um, that kind of net of mutual aid and support um, that quite frankly, there's a good number of Northampton residents don't feel at the moment and who have needs that need to be met. Um, yeah, and yeah. I mean, this might also be an entry point to a lot of the groups that, that operate specifically because people are concerned about the police but still need immediate aid, right? So um, the HRH 413, um, group, right? Like they work and they respond to calls. Uh, one of their members got a call and couldn't speak to our group because there was someone who was worried, who was, you know, concerned about an overdose, but also concerned about housing, right? Because if someone overdoses in your home and you're receiving public assistance, you're that just calling the police puts your housing in jeopardy, right? That subsidy mm -hmm. is in jeopardy. And so what can we do that might create spaces where people could respond, um, without necessarily endangering those other things that people need to survive and then actually connect them with resources. And this is one of the things that I've said is that the resources don't exist yet in a lot of ways, um, or they're not institutionalized in a, in a manner that the city, that there's infrastructure for them, right? There's a lot of side groups that do all these little things. Um, they're contingent on grant funding. They're contingent on, you know, volunteer hours and things like that. So how do we introduce some form of stability to that? Uh, you know, the talk about like the police department not having a, a strategic plan, um, you know, but a lot of these other agencies don't have super detailed strategic plans either, because how do you, how do you plan, you know, 10 years down the line, if you don't know you're going to have funding in three years or how much that is. Um, so finding a way to, to put this, you know, in a space where it can be done and that the people who respond also have options to, to connect people with, um, you know, because even 
And even if you know we, we have the right people responding, if there's no follow-up, right? The person who spoke earlier today um, was like, oh yeah, somebody came after, you know, after I experienced that, somebody came and checked in on me a week later. Um, you know, how do, how do you make sure that there's the resources to do that, um, which is important. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The uh, yeah. The follow up on for for victims uh, is 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 weak to say the least. Yeah. And I think part of the reason it's weak is because the police have continued to have things put on their plate. You know, they can't they can't go back and think about the thing they did a week ago or two weeks ago because they're focused on doing all the little things that they have slowly uh, like taken over over the course of several years. Right. Uh, and this gets back to the whole thing is that like this, this commission, and the recommendations we're doing does not come out of a place of, of hatred or uh, punitive. Right. It's about getting less on their plate so that their days are easier. So our communities are stronger. Right. Um, it, it, it comes from a, uh, uh, like um, a profound place of compassion for not for the, for the community at writ large, you know. And I mean, this is this is to Namdi's point a lot of times, and I'm still struggling. I think there's going to be some. I think there's going to be some difficulty in sort of communicating that effectively, um, because I think a lot of people. I mean, just just today, you know, the the person that that came in and spoke was, you know, like, oh, are you are you the ones that want to do a fifty percent budget cut? <laughs> it's like, no, that's not us. That's an <laughs> activist group. Um, I, I had that last week on the radio interview uh, when I was on Bob Flaherty. He said, you know, the Northampton Police Review Commission is charged with cutting the police budget. And I said, that's not what we're charged with. Uh, <laughs> let's let's just stay, at least state the mission correctly. Yeah. <laughs> right. But there was, I guess there was like an email going around some like message groups um, around the city that, that sort of did misconstrue what we were doing. And I think the Gazette article, which is really nice to see like that there it's out there and it got our information out there so that people could respond, but it did have us and then an immediate transition to the Northampton abolition group and then to my quote, which they were like, oh, have you heard of this group? And I was like, yeah, I've heard of them. And yeah, we agree on some things, but they highlighted yeah. that 50% budget cut. And it's like, I didn't say that I agreed with that. <laughs> I said something, yeah. you know, I mean, in a lot of ways, maybe individually, I'm like, yes, cut the police budget by 50%. Um, but I don't necessarily, like, the logic of how that happens, um, I don't know that we're there yet. And I don't know that for, my, for myself, I still, you know, my, my thought is still responsibility and funds transferred in that sort of iterative way. Um, but I think that's what's, what's confusing to people is they're not really sure what we're what we do <laughs> and they only have the sort of blurbs and the op-eds and and those sort of right. things to, to go by which you know some of them are from people that have clearly never been to our meetings which is fine everyone can say what they want but <laughs> thinking about right what and I mean looking at like so I started looking at like uh, Montreal and um, some of the other places that have done even smaller budget cuts but like or that they're, they're doing sort of the, the reimagining, looking at some of the participatory budget stuff that comes out, um, which is really cool. But a lot of it comes with, there needs to be some funding for community education, both at the level of what the new service is, what it does, how to get a hold of it, um, but also in terms of like really reaching out to say, this is what, um, you know, this is, this is what community care is and establishing why this is even necessary, um, which I hope we can do a little bit of um, in terms of, of framing things as part of our values, but I think it's gonna need a lot more, you know, at the end of the day um, from someone much larger than us to really have those conversations um, and to get at, you know, what is community safety? Um, and how is it being improved by, by making any of these changes? Yeah. Yeah.
uh, these meetings always have me mulling over so many <laughs> corresponding <laughs> ideas. Uh, and one of the biggest ones that I have, that continues to dawn on me is that, the, that you know, as much as we as we do do here in this commission and uh, amongst the subject is that, you know, this is only one piece of of a much larger machine, right? There are other things that our commission is not charged with with handling that need to be addressed in the in the city of Northampton, um, right? Whether it be you know incarceration in general, the the medical profession, you know, all these other interlocking uh, mechanisms that you know don't exist in a vacuum. Um, property taxes, the allocation of funds to schooling through property taxes, you know, all these, all, the, all these other things. And, you know, as, much, as strong as the recommendation we put out there, those things are still going to exist. And, and um, yeah. you know, how do we work within those, uh, those confines and how do we bring light to those things and, and address them? Right. It's a right. It's a hundred million dollar city. It's a, the yeah. budget's a hundred million dollars. And, and, and to your point, this, you know, the police represent, you know, the, the current police budget's a little over 6 million. It's 6% of the whole thing. And, and, and think about the amount of hours and time we're spending here talking about this role. And, yeah. you know, the, the school department's 55%, um, you know, it, discussing the investment in that would be a fascinating discussion for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think this gets to sort of no yawning. <laughs> you're, you're talking about what what the what the police do, like so, like um, you know, Namdi had, had rewritten that first statement, um, you know, that sort of talked about like the 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 power of bias, like to to hear the chief sort of dismiss bias in policing. It's like, well, if the police are as, as biased as the community that they come from. And it was like that moment of like, but, but I don't have this, like my bias doesn't have the same effect on Wait. a human being, right? Like I don't carry a weapon. <laughs> I'm not told that I can use it. I can't arrest somebody, um, all of those things. And so I think that's why- I choose not to. Yeah, or choose not to, right? Or to choose to, to issue a summons to court instead of an arrest to, <laughs> to, you know, stop someone for a minor infraction and then choose to search them. Um, you know, and all of those, those sort of things, like, so it's just that moment of like, I mean, for me, this, this is a lot, but I, I think it's worth it in terms of, of the impact that it can have, you know, 6% of the budget still has a big impact in terms of community outcomes, right? Um, so I'm, at least for me, that, that makes it sort of worth it, right, to think about how we're making things better, and hopefully increasing the, the sort of health and safety of everybody. Um, in these small ways. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I think we're a little bit in a holding pattern. Um, but one thing that I would like to maybe try and do is look, look holistically at what the police budget transformation has been over time. Because um, I, I mean, we can look at the 40% and know that but I'd also be interested to see how some of those things change, um, you know, and, and maybe even like what, I mean, the, trying to think of the right way to phrase this. Um, like what, um, what things Ca that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what they were concerned with in their budgets when they were asking for more money um, or even not even more money, but like when they submitted that, when they submitted those budgets, what, what were they for? What was included in that? I think a lot of people got involved when, you know, the police were like, Oh, we need, you know, we need extra money to buy hybrid vehicles. Um, you know, and, and what's involved in that. And then thinking about what does that mean? Because right? I think for the police, like the, they looked at it and said, wow, we spend a lot of money on gas. We should spend less money on gas. And the way to do that is to buy green vehicles. Um, different people might have said, well, maybe you should be patrolling less <laughs> in vehicles, right? Right. Like maybe that's the way to spend less money. Um, 
you know, and then you, you sort of get into the justification. And I don't think that we're going to be in any position to do that. But do patrols actually make people safer? I have yet to see any evidence that says yes. It's just been mostly a, a history of practice, right? Mm. Um, right. Been trying to dig into it, but I, I haven't well, found certainly it. those those cars, uh, you know, last time around were allocated at you know seventy five thousand dollars each, and there was five in the initial budget. I mean, you know, ten years ago those cars didn't cost seventy five thousand dollars, probably. To your point, they're hybrid now, but also all the bells and whistles and computers and everything else, they probably didn't cost. $75,000 each. So did they cost 40% less? Did they cost 50% less? Like that's part of this increase for sure. Yeah. Right. And then you, and then you add on to like, well, how often do we really need to be replacing them? You know, are our police officers going on high speed pursuits every other week, you know, a general wear and tear, um, you know, there's a warrant having to replace every, uh, you know, every vehicle every few years, or is it something that we'd hold off on? Yeah, that was a question that, that came up in June too, was, you know, they're, they're on a, they've been up until this year where they, there's no money allocated for new cars. They were on a 20% replacement cycle uh, in the Northampton Police Department. And, you know, we were talking about it. Could, what if it was 15? What if it was 13? You know, what, if it was only three new vehicles a year as opposed to five, what would the impact be on the budget? So it's, you know, part of, part of the equation for sure. And, and for me, it was a fascinating part of the equation because it was, you know, always 20%. It, would, it was never 25%. It was never 15%. It's always 20. You know, even in a pandemic when the city is financially facing some, some greater burdens than usual. Yeah, and I think that's, that's sort of, I mean, when we look at, well, my guess is from, I mean, I looked at, you know, a few of the budgets, like, starting back in like 2010 and that's where I saw some of those things where it's like ooh, this like officer you know officer pay is frozen um the there's no hiring the department had 33 people uh which the chief says they have now um so it's interesting to sort of see or to think about like well what's actually going on what what does that mean for those numbers um but but also to think about like what what has happened as sort of automatic. Um, and this is something, you know, talking about police practices, like how much of this has been just automatic uh, and how much of this is just, you know, oh, we request this much and we request it because we did last year, um, where it's not necessarily a good, re tradition is a, a reason that we do a lot of things. <laughs> um, you know, it's not necessarily a well thought out or a rational reason, um, but it's a reason. And so, looking at, at some of those, I think digging in um, as much as we can. Again, we just have the budget description and I don't think we ever received the um, the end of year reporting that we had asked for. Um, I, or at least I don't believe so. Um, so. I think that might be a thing to ask again for um, or confirmation of, of what file was was that. Um, just to make sure, because I'm not, I'm not sure that we got the end of year. So we just have the budgets, which is good, but doesn't necessarily tell us what they spent at the end of the year as well. Um, and I think Michael, I'm going to ask you a question, which is when it comes to, <laughs> um, when it comes to positions that are unfilled or if a person leaves a position, um, the money from that position, if it was budgeted, um, goes back and you said to the general, to the general fund. Is that correct? Yeah, the general um, stability stabilization fund. Okay. It's really actually called that. Um, and yeah, right, because all of the money that's in the general fund that's allocated that doesn't get spent goes goes in, you know, it doesn't get spent out of that fund, basically, is what it is. Um, so it doesn't really flow back into it as much as it just never comes out. Okay. So just thinking about like what, I, I'm not even I'm not even articulating this question very well, but just sort of the, the question. So the chief has said that she's lost 10 people. Um, as I heard another one that said six, so I'm not 100% sure where 
where that is. Um, but in terms of the staffing, you know, if you're losing staff, <laughs> um, does that also affect, I mean, I guess the, the first question is like, if you're losing staff, what happens to those, what happens to those resources? Um, I know Councilor Labarge had said sort of, if you lose a police officer, hire a social worker and just use that, right? Um, it, I don't think that's gonna be the, the solution here, but, but in, ter in terms of like, how would that play out though? So like, if, if there is attrition um, from a department, and I guess this is the question. It's like, would it be more palatable to a group or, or would it be more palatable to folks to say, all right, when an officer retires, then we'll transfer. It, it becomes harder because then you're sort of losing the connection between responsibilities because it's more of like an officer, which. Yeah. I don't even yeah, know. I mean, that's like a, like a, almost like a hiring freeze uh, yeah. situation. I mean, you know, I think. I think you were going to ask one thing I was going to going to mention, I think you were kind of leading towards this. Um, you know, it, one thing that I, I was told this week and uh, the person that told me has a pretty good working mastery of of this whole thing and of the budget uh, and the uh, the contract with with the police union uh, is that if a, if a police officer leaves Northampton to go to work in another, um, you know, police department, they don't transfer their seniority with them. Uh, it doesn't transfer from town to town. Uh, and so you generally tend to, in these, in these cases, not lose people that have built a lot of seniority. I mean, that, that's to, for, for people that have built a lot of seniority to leave, they lose an awful lot uh, of, of, of what they've really put into the system. And so, uh, you know, but if a, like last year, there was a position that was empty in the, in this budget and, and it was, I think it was a sergeant's position. I'm not going to bother looking it up now. But but so it was a, it was not the a patrol officer. It was at, at least at the next level, if not the one above that even. Uh, and so there was some discussion about can you know can the city council just eliminate that position? And the city council didn't have the right to do that. We we could cut money from the budget, and we could even cut that specific amount. But that didn't mean that the police department wouldn't need to fill that role to continue operating and then lose somebody at the lower level. Like it, it, like somebody was getting that promotion, whether their money was there or not. Cause the, the, you know, again, because of the way the contract's set up your, you know, any layoffs or anything like that are going to happen at the bottom of the, uh, of the chain. And so all of this kind of, kind of, I think you were kind of hinting at some of this uh, there. So I wanted to just put this information out. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that was one of the things, um, because I know that the, the unions do have, you know, some recourse for those scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. like, like they can, they can still renegotiate to say, okay, you have X amount of money for personnel. Uh, we know that budget cuts are coming rather than cut a whole position. You know, everyone's going to take a 2% pay cut or something like that. Like those are all, those are all options that, you know, the union and the, and the city could negotiate for. Um, I don't know. I, I, I still, I, I don't know why, and no one's no one's explained sort of why they didn't engage in that sort of thing for impact bargaining. I I, I don't understand why why they wouldn't. Um, but it I'm wasn't not, um, it I, wasn't done in any department in the city. Um, you know, they're they're you know this is something that that around the pandemic specifically you saw companies do this. Um, you know, and even even um, even companies have done it via, via furlough you know, everyone's taking X number of weeks off so that everyone can at least work 48 weeks this year uh, or get paid for 48 weeks. And, you know, the city didn't do that with anything. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't how they, they put this budget together. I mean, that was, um, you know, UMass did that and our unions actually mm -hmm. fought and said, right. no, we don't want like these indefinite layoff or indefinite furloughs or layoffs. And, you know, we as a union actually said, here's our counter proposal like and engage us in this bargaining process. And I don't understand why the police union wouldn't have done that for theirs. Or maybe they tried and the city said, no, I, I, again, I don't know where, right. where that part in the relationship was there, but I would like to encourage that. <laughs> um, you know, if, if it does come to making, you know, large scale budget cuts that can't be offset through something else. Um, and again, I don't think that it will, but like, like leaving at least that door open so that there is space, you know, where the police chief is saying that these are the best and the brightest and, 
that these are the most diverse um, and that's going to make things better. I'm going to really push to say, show me how and where <laughs> having a more diverse right. police staff actually makes things better because most of the stuff that I've read says eh, it's still not that great. Like again, minor improvements, but not major ones. Um, but thinking about you know, what avenues are still open though for the city to say, okay, so maybe we do want to roll back on some of the, so like, um, you know, there's a half a million dollars in incentives for police officers in that budget. It's just one line item. I don't know if that encompasses everything. Like, I don't know what's in there because there's no explanation. Uh, and I think some of it is the Quinn bill. I would say probably a good, a good amount of that is the Quinn bill. Um, but what else is in there? Is that a negotiable thing? <laughs> um, you know, can you negotiate some of that, you know, with, with, the, with the understanding that like the unions are gonna have to give up something, um, but they could preserve, you know, officer positions, um, you know, um, I think that's, officer retention is gonna be a question anyway, especially if we do think, if we do find a way to open up detail pay, um, to people equitably, right? Um, you know, the chief said that, you know, they're not able to fill all of the detail pay that they have. And so it opens up to other cities, which is fine. Um, but for those that they do, I mean, some of these officers are working basically a second job doing detail work, um, which makes it a very attractive thing if you want to spend that time. Um, I'm a little concerned that they, you know, they just watch over time <laughs> where you have an officer working was like 5,776 hours. Um, and I'll say when we switched over to remote learning, I was doing, you know, 60 to 80 hours a week, um, you know, in my job and I was not at my best. Um, yeah, same. You know, like, so like what's happening in those cases, I think it's important to think about sort of regulating that to say if you're going to be responding to high-speed calls to all of these really tense situations that you know the chief has said that they're worried that police officers are nervous to go on because they're so volatile or they're mm -hmm. so dangerous like maybe that needs to be capped um you know in some form and you know, maybe that's something that the whole city takes as as a posture of you know nobody should be working 70 hours a week <laughs> um you know yeah. You know, when we talked about this initially, uh, I think, Josie, I think it was you, you made a comment about like how it's not necessarily in your nature to think about like limiting someone's ability to make their, their income. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, there, you know, you do wonder if there should be restrictions just based on people being, like you said, Dan, a minute ago at their best. Yeah. And especially, especially given the, the, the very nature of the job. Right. Yeah. If, if you are, if you are the, the guardian per se, right. For a community and you are also working those 70 hours, you know, those, those extra 30 hours that you work for your other job uh, are going to impact how you work the regular 40. And like, where does that responsibility start and end? And what are the expectations there? Uh, you know, I'm like happy for you making more income, right. Everyone could use a little more money. Absolutely. But you know, if it's impacting, the work that you do for the community, which is which should be the primary like role of a police officer, then I think that's a question we need to have, a conversation we need to have. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna put it on myself to dig into those budgets a little bit. I think I'm gonna do some of that too, Dan. I'm interested in that. So I was gonna say I would love it if somebody else would also look because I like I'm not an expert in, in reading budgets. So I think for the most part, I can figure them out, but some of it's going to be like, sort of like Googling furiously and going like, why does this look weird to me? Um, <laughs> trying to figure out what process <laughs> it is. No, I, I, I like when I was looking at it the first time I had like multiple windows open with like different phrases and it's like, all right, let's go back, reference that term. Okay. Here it is again. Here, like, um, and it was keeping track of like the, stabilization fund and then looking at all these different ex like expenditure trends and then trying to keep track of things it's like i can't <laughs> yeah it's, it's I, don't really anyone, something. I don't know how anyone has the mind to to look at those and go yeah this makes perfect sense and be able to explain <laughs> like i sat through like those 
you know, I was watching the, the city council meetings for it. And I was just like, I don't understand what's happening right now. I'm like trying to like take notes and read along. <laughs> like, I don't get it. Yeah. It's, um, well, it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, and there's a couple of counselors specifically that, that it does click for them. Uh, you know, but I will admit that it, it, it takes me a lot more. I feel like it takes me a lot more effort to comprehend it. Right. Oh, Dan, are you frozen? I think Dan's frozen. I think so too. <laughs> hey, Dan, you there? Oh, he's back. Hey. (laughs) (laughs) You're muted. Now you're muted. All right, there we go. Yeah, Uh, I don't know what just happened. I went from like saying, oh, is there anything else people want to do? And then Zoom doubled and then closed on me. (laughs) Yeah, you you, you froze. (laughs) When you came back on, you were muted. What the heck? I'll take it. It's fine. Yeah, Uh, should should we look at scheduling our next... Uh, yeah, meeting. I think we should. So what from what I know is that the only thing scheduled for next week at the moment is the uh, policies from uh, on the 22nd from 4.30 to 6. And the, uh, the 23rd, 6 to 8, it will be the full commission. Full commission, right. yeah. But that, that, like, we don't have the agendas in, but that's every every Tuesday until we finish, so. Yeah. <laughs> that, one, that one's a hard. <laughs> and maybe more. <laughs> Yeah, so I do. I, I know that, uh, and this meeting is one included that before we we're doing like five o'clock uh, next week and going forward, I will be in person teaching again. Uh, so I oh. will be commuting. Uh, and so I, I would like us to start just a little bit later. I'm just talking like 5 30 versus five. Um, but that's basically it for me. I can do any day. Yeah. Um, where are we? February. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I just have like, I'm trying to make it to the other commission meetings. Um, but yeah, I want to hop into the, uh, what is it? Alternatives that are happening right now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know when the, um, the outreach committee is going to meet because we're just, uh, we're meeting Thursday. Um, which by the way, if you haven't uh, if Noah hasn't sent out the email. Uh, we are, we have our survey. It's live. It's on the city website. Um, so hopefully we'll get some responses there. Um, but I don't know when the next time we'll meet is. Um, the So for me, it's basically just like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I, yeah, I have to work Thursday night, but I could do, I could do Wednesday if that works for you both. Yeah. Yeah. Wednesday at Wednesday, 530. 530 to 730. Sounds good. All right. Uh, in terms of topics, uh, I think there's a few more that Dan you had uh, pointed out to earlier. Uh, I feel like we've covered a, a good deal of them, and I've I've gotten some really strong points and ideas for a lot of them. Um, but something that came up during this uh, meeting that I think uh, raises some interesting questions is. Uh, you know, the idea of hiring freezes, overtime caps, salaries in general. Um, uh, of course, this is something that would have to be negotiated with the police unions next bargaining uh, cycle. But I mean, I think it's something that we should consider and maybe have a point on the, the, the final kind of report on like, you know, where we stand or like some recommendations. Yeah, I think it gets it gets a little tricky outside of like just saying like we we would encourage the the city and the unions to both bargain in good faith, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, right. You know, but I mean, I think one of the things that we had, we had talked about was sort of saying like what's in these what's in these contract languages that we would like to change, um, and you know, do we want to would we want to encourage the city when it negotiates? for the next round to encourage them to have language of accountability of, I, mean, I don't think they're going to do anything with, um, you know, um, qualified immunity, right? Like that's, that's, that's going nowhere. Um, <laughs> you know, it, in Massachusetts anyway, until, <laughs> until they strengthen that. Although there was a Supreme court ruling, which might have some implications because it, it sort of went that Supreme court decision it wasn't like um, like cases were heard. They just issued their decision, and it 
sort of implied a limit to qualified immunity, but I haven't read enough and I'm not a lawyer to, to speak to exactly. So I have to go find a lawyer's interpretation of it. Um, right. But we could have something about accountability um, and you know, maybe including language that ties department, you know, department funding and availability to you know, measurable objectives. Um, you know, and that the unions agree that they'll do that. And then you still have to decide what those measurable objectives are. But I think that's one way because, you know, the chief, when she was asked about, um, you know, the sort of like, what are you gonna do for, um, like, what do you do with the, the calls where somebody's not violating a law, um, but they're acting in a way that makes a community member feel unsafe. And the answer is like, oh, well, those are customer service, you know, sort of complaints. So. We talk with them and that's kind of it, right? There's no recourse. So giving the, you're basically advocating, giving the chief the resources to deal with personnel issues, <laughs> which, you know, the union's of course not going to want to go for, um, right? In most cases, they don't want to give up that power, but to really give them, give the chief some avenue, right? So if she's really concerned with, you know, sort of, you know, I hate customer service, but she's concerned with customer service, um, you know, and wants to to do that, at least give her the tools in which to do that, either a carrot or a stick or both, right? Right. Right. But also I don't I don't know what language that what language that might take. I can brainstorm some stuff, but I don't know what would make sense in this con in this context right i'm just um writing down some ideas um mm -hmm. so yeah so do uh just just to get a sense of consensus uh, do we like the idea of talking uh focusing a little bit of our, our Knox conversation around the idea of salaries over time the, the contract like what potential bargaining chips we're working, we could uh, recommend working with. I think the other part yeah. is that, um, so on Tuesday, the hope is that we'll talk more about the Department of Community Care uh, and should mm -hmm. be sending out a document that sort of asks people to, um, on their own, fill out basically a, a sort of, it's like 10 questions basically. Uh, but sort of fill it out so that when we come back to talk, we have an idea, you know, everyone's sort of prepared and can talk about what they expect this department to do. Like, what, what's the scope of the department? How much, you know, what sort of staffing do you imagine? Where do you imagine it living? Um, what are things that the police do that this department would take? But also, what are the things that, that this department would take that aren't done by the police? It could be by another city group or city agency, but it also could be Done, things that are done by nonprofits, um, you know, like and, and at the moment, right? So if we say, "Wow, it'd be really nice if the like the resilient, like the a warming center, <laughs> wasn't run by you know Mana and it was run by this department," I could see like I would advocate you know having a warming space, a year-round warming shelter, um, and also having more than one. <laughs> I think you know like lobby space with you know something comfortable something that would allow people to take naps that would allow them to stay warm or cool things like that but like those sort of things um because then what we take from that you know on tuesday we could then on wednesday talk about okay what what might those things like what do we what do we think might need to happen from our end as well or what input can we give right um, to that to that idea, I, I can't remember what city did it, but I think uh, I think maybe Seattle. I forget, but one city recently allocated part of its budget to then go and purchase property that they were using to house uh, houseless individuals. And like, you know, is that something that's feasible? I mean, you know, I drive on King Street. There's that huge lot that uh, that the police do just sit at and watch people. And you know, what does that look like? Uh, just a thought that I've, I've had recently. Yeah, I mean, that was Austin and that that comes out of, you know, they're doing like a hundred thousand, a hundred million dollar cut in a year. Right. You know, because the, the hotels that they were purchasing were like six million dollars. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, to make those purchases. But, you know, they're also buying a gigantic hotel. Um, right. I think there's more that gets involved if the city's buying property, um, like, to repurpose rather than, like, like just preservation. Yeah, like, eminent, so. eminent domain. and Yeah, um, but yeah. it might be worth at least thinking about, like, you know, long-term investment, you know, what, what could that, what, what could you do? Um, and I mean, I'm going to knock on wood that everything recovers and we hit normalcy at some point soon, but like, if we don't, like, there's already so many spaces, right? Like, um, oh, now I don't remember who had said it, you know, someone was talking about like community centers, um, in Northampton, it's like, uh, Spoletto's the old Spoletos that's right in the center of town that's gone unused for like a decade. You know, like what what could go there that could be like, you know, a resource center for everybody that could be space for anybody, um, you know, in terms of like open to the public, like places that would, would have buy-in, but also could have real purpose and, and meaning. Um, so sort of thinking about some of those things. I mean, obviously, there's a lot involved with <laughs> anything like that. that. Yeah. And, you know, the, the sort of building owners and property owners and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but just, at least thinking, private property. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, kidding, kidding. <laughs> but, but to say like, what, what would it take, you know, for the, what would need to happen for the city to do these things? I don't think it's wrong to sort of at least lay out sort of what, what the, what the steps are. You know, right. if we're talking about these as potential things that, that could be done. Cool. So I just want to make sure that I got this right. It's next Wednesday. It's 5.30 to 7.30. Yep. Awesome. Great. Thank you. I'll make sure to get that to Noah uh, ASAP. Yeah. Um, Uh, can may I make a motion to adjourn? Yeah, second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Noah's not here, so I'll do uh, I'll do the count off. So uh, unless anyone wants to discuss, of course. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, Michael. Yes. Dan. Yes. And myself, Josie. Yes. Awesome. I will see great. some of you maybe the alternatives meeting. But besides that, I hope yeah. you have a wonderful day. Great conversation as always. Great ideas. A lot yeah. of, of good points brought up. Yeah. Thanks to you both. Yeah. Everybody soon and or soonish. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Bye.